Talk with Mitch LaFon. We are speaking with uh, John Fratelli. The new album or the new song is uh, Strangers in the Street featuring P.P. Uh, P. Arnold. Uh, as we say in Montreal, uh, bonjour, John. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. Good. Uh, pleasure to have you on today. So l- let us talk, of course, obviously about this single and working with P.P. P. Arnold. Her, her career stretches back some uh, 50 years. H- how did this connection come about? And what does she add to the song? Uh, so the the connection is 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 a strange one because I, I can't remember now right. uh, how how this even how this even came about. I, I think really it was just that you know we had already written and recorded this song uh, for our new record, which which should have been out. Um, God at the beginning of this month, but as lots of things are, it's been postponed. Uh, so when we, we had this song, it was written, it was recorded. And more than one person mentioned that, um, you know, it was the kind of song that, well, it, as somebody uh, said, uh, you know, it's a shame that this is that you, you're singing this song uh, rather than somebody else. And I think that was the most succinct way to put it. <laughs> anyway, there was this idea of you know this is a song that I did I did an okay job on I guess but right. everyone had, a few people had commented on you know it might be this song might suit a female singer for a start but it's got to be the right kind of singer you know you can you can find a million female vocalists but you know they're not necessarily going to bring something to the table that that's that special. Uh, and then somehow somebody mentioned P.P. P. Arnold uh, and straight away, given like I, I know, uh, you know, enough about her career and I know enough, I've heard her sing often enough that, that when that name came up, I thought, yeah, that one will work. Uh, and then given the lockdowns happened, somebody had the, had the idea, and I can't remember who, you see record labels and, 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 and management and all these people who are usually involved, they tend to come up with these ideas uh, uh, with no um, with no accounting for for how you would actually do it. Right. Um, so uh, so we had to sort of scramble together. A, uh, you know, basically not rewrite the song, but 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 rework it in a way that would suit her, uh, and then find a way. To get the three band members, who are all in, you know, different places, right. and P.P. Arnold, uh, who, who lives in Spain, uh, to somehow be able to to put this track together, and and we managed it. You know, I, I the only thing I, I would wish is that is that if we could have done it again, you know, then. It probably isn't ideal to be to be recording anything so remotely, you know. Yeah. Um, so that's the only thing that's a slight regret. But given all of that, I think I think it turned out it turned out okay. I think it turned out great. Uh, let's get over quickly to the uh, to the album "Half Drunk Under a Full Moon," scheduled for a May release, uh, postponed until October thirtieth. Talk to me about the, the decision to postpone it and why that's important. I would think that right now you have a very captive audience. They can hear you. They're there. They're ready to go. Why sort of say, okay, we'll, we'll do this later? You know, I won't pretend to, to completely understand uh, the, the reason behind that. I mean, I guess, you know, if, if you're like Beyonce, for instance, you can put a record out anytime and, and you don't even have to do much in the way of a lead up to it you know you, you can drop it at, you know at midnight one day without telling anybody and, and it'll you know it'll be the biggest selling record of that year still pretty much everybody else has to have some sort of uh, lead up to, to a release where you know where you have a schedule of, of promo and of Various bits and pieces that might help that record, um, you know, get more notice. 
and and I guess that was why we postponed it because all of the things that were planned, you know, we now can't do. Because um, you know everything's been put on hold. You know, we also by this point we should have done uh, a UK tour, and at the moment we should have been in the middle of a, a North American tour. Um, so you know, pretty much everything has just been been wiped. But that's the same for everybody. It is, and and it is a a, a difficult situation. Uh, you did, of course, on this album when it does come out. You did work with producer Tony Hoffer, who's worked with Beck and Supergrass and a bunch of others. He has done most of your records, except for maybe one or two. Talk to me about what he brings to the band and what he brings to the sound, because you know you look back at the day at you know uh, George Martin or Bob Rock or Mutt Lang, and and bands are associated with a producer because they are that sort of fifth guy in the room, sixth guy in the room, etc. What does he bring it and why keep going back to Tony? He, you know, you, you, you're talking really about something ineffable. You know, you mentioned George Martin there. You know, people, people could and have written, and I've read a lot of these books, you know, they've written multiple books where, where they try and pinpoint uh, why why George Martin was as important to the Beatles as he was. And all they can really do is to, to retell anecdotes and to retell stories about, well, they were in the studio one day and, you know, they had this song and it was George Martin that decided to do this. Those are just details, you know, they're, anybody can, can, can talk about details. You know, that, that isn't, that doesn't describe or explain what he brought to the Beatles. It's something ineffable. And, and with us and Tony in our own way, uh, he brings something that, that you know, I, I can describe some of it, but it, it'll never get quite cl- close. Um, but um, when it comes to sound, what's happened over the years is that more and more I've started to write and started to arrange and started to think of sound based on what he does. And, and I think it's that it actually ended up being really helpful because, you know, if you come in to, if you come in to do a record uh, and you have a certain producer involved and you bring in this, this bunch of material that you're asking them to, to help, uh, you know, turn into something, you know, you have to bring in something that they can actually work with. You know, there's no point in us bringing in something that is so, you know, so different to, to what he, to, to where his talent lies. Um, so more and more what's happened is I, I found myself writing and, and, and sort of creating stuff based on the fact that he's going to be the producer. And what's happened over the years is that we sort of, you know, moved closer and closer together. Uh, and then I think, uh, you know, the result of that is that we're we're now making uh, better records than we ever did, and we're now making the kind of records that that I can be happy with. Um, and and really, I think that that's something that comes from working with. Uh, one person for a, a long period of time you know you, you you start to morph into almost the same the same individual yeah you get into that zone as they as, as it's sometimes described uh you did mention that you were supposed to be on tour the tour was going to be sponsored by the views brand uh, a british american tobacco subsidiary uh, talk to me about that in 2020, about being sponsored by a tobacco company. Uh, some will say, hey, it's a freedom of choice and you can do whatever. And others will say, oof, what is that? Uh, talk to me about that and, and, and how did that sponsorship deal come together? And I'm not judging, by the way. Yeah, how it came together, again, I have no idea. Um, okay. but th- this, is, this is why... Um, this is why bands have have management and have you know work with other people. I have absolutely no problem with it in the slightest. You know, it, it in this day and age, it's it's a a non-issue as far as I'm concerned. 
uh, we, you know, it would be really hypocritical of us anyway, given that we're more or less a band of smokers, you know, uh, and vapors, as it, as it turns out. Um, but also, you know, if 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 a company, no matter who they are, sort of knocks on your door and 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 wants to basically underwrite your tour, you know, you you have two choices. You say you know, no thanks or yes, please. Some people are in the position to say no thanks uh, and we're not in that position. Um, you know, uh, so it's pretty much as straightforward as that. And and if, if, if this is something that gets brought up as a question, uh, you know, I, I'll have the same answer. And, I, and I, it, anybody who, who did have an issue with it, I, I would... You know, I, I would find it odd, you know. Yeah. And, and listen, people are going to have issues with everything. Uh, I ask because the band has had a lot of sponsorship or has had a lot of commercial, uh, you know, ventures with bands or, or with songs and other companies. The other one being Apple iPod with the song Flathead, which appeared in a lot of their commercials. Talk to me about that sponsorship and how important was it to get the band discovered? Because to have your music in a commercial that was seen by billions of people, obviously it's got to move the goal, you know, it's got to move the ball forward in terms of what you did as a band. It, uh, you know, I, I can't, I, I, I assume that it was, you know, incredibly helpful. Uh, and again, you know, you, you, you either turn those things down and, you know, almost certainly w- wind y- your career in the, in the process, you know, or you, or you say yes. I mean, why else? You know, you've got, you've got this, the creative side of things on the one hand, but on the other hand, you know, there, uh, there's absolutely nobody who can deny that the uh, this business is a commercial business. You know, everyone is uh, hopefully, you know, trying to make a living off of it. And uh, but the the Apple thing was a no brainer at the time. You know, that was the coolest advert in the world at that point. Everybody wanted it, the the Apple ad. Yeah, and, and 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 a lot of songs have been discovered on it. As re as as I was re- researching for this interview, there was an article that said. 30 songs that were first heard on Apple and it included yours. And I was like, yeah, look at all these people that they've they've promoted, I guess, or helped build a career with. So, listen, I'm all down for that. You know, brand over band. Um, 2009, you take a hiatus. Was that really designed as a hiatus or had you gotten to a point where you just say, F these guys, I'm out of here. We're done. End of the road. See you later. Because you did go do another band. Uh, was it a, a real growing frustration? And did you sort of look back a couple of years later and go, oh, we sort of had a good thing. Maybe we should get back to it. Yeah, you know, I, I, I've said this before when anybody's asked, you know, it was just sheer sort of lu- lunacy on my part, you know. Uh, and, and what you described there was pretty much what it was. You know, you... you for some reason, at that time, uh, uh, that was the one thing that had to happen. Uh, but you know, those things have to happen to you before you learn the, the lesson. You know, you have to you have to get these things wrong. Uh, and I hope I hope to continually get things wrong because then I might learn something. Uh, and and the reason we got back together again was was really simple. There was a long enough period where you'd completely forgotten what the problem was. You know, you you, you would be hard pushed to even put it into words. You know what the problem was. Um, but you know, really, there was also just this realization that there was still an audience there who who would want, who would come and see us play. And that's a really simple thing. You know, that's really a. You, you know, you. I think probably I forgot that that was all you ever wanted was a, was an audience to play to. All the other stuff that that might come with it, uh, 
you know, that that really is pretty unsatisfactory. Um, but having the audience, that's all we ever wanted. It's all anybody who pretty much, whether they know it or not, who, who starts a band. You know, they, you, you do do it because you have this this desire to do it. You know, there's nothing that will stop you doing it. But it really is pretty hollow unless you have an audience. Uh, um, and, you know, we realised that there was still an audience there. And I'm so glad that we that we did do that because this second period has been, uh, is, apart from being personally the most fruitful, it's been the most satisfying. I can imagine. Now, you have, of course, done a Codeine Velvet Club and you've done a couple of solo albums. Now that the band has Half Drunk Under a Full Moon coming out later this year, do you see yourself moving just with the band and that's sort of going to be the next three, four, five years? Or do you still have this creative desire to step out and say something as a solo artist and say something within another group, you know, with a different musical vision, perhaps? How do you see yourself going down the road? Are, are you just John from the Fratellis or are you John from these different entities as well? Um, you know, you, you, you are those things depending on, on, depending on the songs that you write. You know, as, as long as I'm able to, 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 to make the kind of music that suits the band, then, I, you know, I'll keep doing that until I die. And the great thing is with, with the Fratellis is I have, I have free reign to pretty much bring in anything I want. And that's really, I can't think of a more perfect scenario. Um, but the thing is, sometimes you do write songs that just won't suit the band. You know, they won't suit the audience that the band has. So the only reason I, I released like a, a solo record, like I have no, I have no desire to be. The whole idea of having to have a solo record, you know, it it usually seems to smack of, of that desperation to break away from the, the the outfit that you're with. That that wasn't the case for for me when I I released a, a record of my own like last year. It it just so happened I had written this bunch of songs. Um, and when you, you know, when, when you've taken, when you've written these songs and then you've recorded them and taken them to the sort of finished point, again, you have two choices. You can leave it there and, you know, nobody ever hears them or you, or you can put it out. Um, and it's all completely song dependent. Uh, and I have absolutely no say over, over what songs I write, you know. These are, that's something that's way out of my control. Um, but if I had any say, then, you know, as long as I can keep writing the kind of music that suits the band, I, I would just keep doing that as long as I'm allow, allowed to do that. I'm going to ask you just real quick on that. How do you sort of make that distinction? How do you sort of have the A pile and the B pile? You know, th this is the Fratelli's pile and this is the other pile. How what what does a song have to have to go into those different piles? Why is it not just one big pile that can everything go on the Fratellis? You know, like, ideally, it's not even ideally, but, you know, that, that you can definitely work that way. As you were asking that question there, the answer actually seemed quite obvious, which is, uh, you know, <laughs> the, the, song, the songs that are just too slow to suit the band would be the ones that I almost instantly say, you know, let's let's leave. You know, that's not going to suit our audience. You know, because if you if you bring things back to to live shows, there is just no point in selling tickets to live shows and, and taking people's money and then you know playing, you know a third or a half of, of the gig with songs that they just, they either don't know or that they, you know, they can't, they can barely move their hips to, you know, I, 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 I have this other sort of style of music that suits me that, you know, nobody moves their hips to, to that music. 
So, you know, I think actually it, it's that really t tempo isn't a. It's, it seems like a really strange uh, way of deciding things, but probably it comes down to tempo. Um, I can imagine. I mean, I. I'm, I'm assuming if you're ACDC and, and, you know, Brian Johnson is writing, uh, t you know, drippy love ballads at some point they go, huh. Eh, yeah. No and, and if he's got, if he's got 10 of those songs, you know, th th they'll probably start to, to form around each other and sit each other and work off of each other. And, you know, that's all an album is. So you, you, it really comes down to your desire. If you have those songs, you know, you can have them. You don't have to record them. You don't. I don't have to spend, you know, the money that that, that needs to be spent to, to to take these things past the point where you've just written them. You know, you, you write them and that takes them up to here, and then, to, you know, you could stop there. But there's this other other part of the road with it that you can that you you know where you would record them. Once you've done that, again, you could just like. And, and I've done this where I, I've recorded things and, 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 you know, spent huge sums of money in the past, like making a record and then deciding, oh, I'm not going to put this out. And, and you, you know, I can still do that, but there's a certain point where, you know, you realize that this whole enterprise, the whole point I feel of music is that it's communal. You know, it, it, it's... And, and music to me feels incomplete unless it's shared. You know, there's this other half of the circle that that will always be incomplete because music is supposed to be is supposed to be communal. I agree, and and we'll finish on this. Uh, we did touch upon the live experience, the sponsorship, and the communal experience. Uh, where do we see ourselves going in the future? Because it 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 seems clear right now in in May of 2020 that a traditional concert that we have seen for the last 50 years is probably not going to happen for the next year. May never happen again. We're we're. How do you see us going forward? Is the live experience going to be back with? You know, four guys on the stage and a and a big sweaty audience, or what happens? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. It, it, you might be right that maybe for the next year, you know, certainly this year, I, I don't see anybody having any live shows over a certain number of people for the rest of the year. I don't know that officially, but that's what it seems like. But but. You know that's not the end of it. You know, um, there there are too many. Because you know, it's, if you think of the, the live situation of music, there's so many other um, enterprises that 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 you could put in a in a similar boat. You know, I mean, sporting events, I guess. You know, they never. Of course, they're going to happen again. You know. We collectively love these things too much that, uh, the, and the idea that they're not important, you know, I've, I've certainly read that over the last few months, you know, these things are, are unimportant. You know, they're clearly, clearly that's not the case or, you know, hundreds and of thousands of people wouldn't be watching soccer matches in the UK like every week. These things are important, and the live music thing is 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 like that, and and you know it it has to happen because there's a desire for it. You know, as long as the, the desire is there, then it'll happen. I do think that it'll happen again. My my concern is when you look at the big venues, your Wembleys, your Bell Centers in Canada, your Staples Centers in in Los Angeles. The bands that can play those venues, I think, will survive and will go on. I think it's all those middle ground ones, those 500 seaters, those 200 seaters, where currently there are no fans, there are no shows, and those bands and and those bars may not reopen. And so you're you're gonna have you know the rookie that's playing his basement, and you're gonna have the guy in the in the Wembley, and it's that middle ground where you're just gonna go, there's nowhere to go. You know that's a good point. It's a good point, and and. And um, that would be, I, I still think that would be okay in, in, in the long run. In the short term, 
yeah, that might, it really could be an issue. You know, it's like here in Glasgow in the last week, I'm starting to, to notice the odd little sort of coffee shop starting to open up again, just for takeaway. Um, and I guess we'll, we'll see fairly soon as these places start to reopen a little bit more, you know, each time. We'll, we'll start to see which ones have been able to actually survive mm -hmm. and come back. Will there be music venues that, that don't come back? I, I, I would be almost certain that that's the case. But, you know, to come back to what I just said earlier, I think when there's the desire, it's incredible, it's incredible what can happen as long as there's desire there for, for people to, to, to want to, to make these things happen. You know, you, 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 you can make anything happen if, you, if, you, if the desire is strong enough. And if the desire from, from the people who have made those venues work for all these years, if that desire is still there, then it will happen. I think it will. Uh, and I'll remind the folks, uh, Strangers in the Street, featuring a soul icon, uh, P.P. Arnold, available now. Uh, as we say in Montreal, uh, merci, John. Uh, absolute pleasure. Thank you. Pleasure. Nice to talk to you. You too. Cheers. Bye-bye now. All right, that worked.